I also wanted to share a couple of quick Audubon updates. Uh, we have a new website where you can stay up to date on our programming, and I'm going to post the link to that in the chat box, but it is www.sevtas.org, which is hopefully a little bit easier to find and remember than our old blogspot page, and that's in the chat box now. And then the other quick Audubon update I wanted to give was to put in a plug for the Christmas bird count. Uh, the 121st National Audubon Christmas Bird Count will take place all over the world between December 14th and January 5th. And the Brattleboro Count will happen on Saturday, December 19th. This will be the 60th year the count has been had. Um, there will be a couple of changes, um, as you might expect due to COVID, where um, the compilation potluck is going to be held on Zoom and we won't get to enjoy everybody's terrific cooking this year, unfortunately. But you'll still be able to... Um, exchange stories from the field of what you saw and kind of keep track of what everyone saw. Um, we're also gonna ask that folks only ride in vehicles with people from their own households. So instead of big carpools, we might have caravans. And then we're also asking folks to stay socially distant, stay six feet apart, you know, wear a mask when at all possible, especially if you're gonna be close to each other. Um, but we really think that we can still carry it out safely and we're excited to keep that tradition alive. If you're interested in joining a, feed, a field count or conducting a feeder count from your home, you can email me and I'll put my email address in the chat box in a minute um, and you can get signed up for that. We also have details on our website about it. Um, and of course, if you're somebody who's done it in the past, I'm sure that the area leader for your portion of the count circle will be reaching out to you shortly to work out details for the day of the count. And without further ado, tonight's presenter is Sam Apgar. Sam is a fifth year PhD candidate in the Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department at the University of Connecticut. She is a member of Dr. Chris Elphick's lab and studies the behavioral and physiological adaptations of birds breeding in tidal marshes. Sam presented at an Audubon meeting back in 2018 and we are happy she's able to join us today to provide an update on her work and what she's been able to learn about this fascinating ecosystem and its birds. Welcome, Sam. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm happy to be back today. Um, I'm going to uh, structure this presentation, I think a little differently than last time. I'm going to um, provide some background info um, from the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program, the collaboration I'm a part of, some of the uh, findings we've had um, up to date, how that impacted the research gaps I'm filling in with uh, my research, some preliminary results, um, especially for my behavioral chapter, uh, which uh, I definitely talked about last time, and then where I'm going hereafter as I'm still um, completing analyses for other um, research papers related to my research. Okay, so with that, uh, introducing ourselves and reorienting ourselves to tidal marshes. Uh, tidal marshes are um, a very in interesting ecosystem found on the coast uh, between your um, ocean and further upland environments. Tidal marshes are characterized by low-lying grasses and sedge vegetation that regularly floods with tidal waters. And this is just showing at the same site as it transitions within just a couple of hours from being relatively dry to uh, inundated with seawater. And this uh, varies with the lunar schedule each month. So you can have days where you have a high tide that doesn't flood the marsh, and then leading up to the new and full moons, you can have high tides that completely flood the marsh. And as if you're a bird that nests in this ecosystem, that's going to force you to nest in uh, the grass close to the ground because there aren't really shrubs or trees or other higher um, places to put your nest. And so evidently the species that I study deal with nest flooding on a regular basis. So again, the research I'm going to talk about uh, for the next few slides came from this larger group uh, you may or, may or may not have heard of before, the Salt Marsh Habitat and Avian Research Program. Um, here's just a picture outlining a lot of the um, professors, graduate students, postdoctoral researchers um, who've worked together through these uh, five different universities uh, throughout the past 11 or 12 years uh, studying tidal marshes across the Northeast, both in terms of habitat and uh, the bird life that's there. Okay, and just uh, orienting you to how this group has gone about studying marsh birds over the past 11 years. 
Um, oops, I see a typo where I didn't fill something in. You couldn't ignore the list down there. Um, but this is coming from one of the papers, just a figure from one of our papers over the years um, showing our demographic sites. So at 23 sites throughout the coast of Northeastern US, throughout the years, um, we've gone out and had teams that regularly regularly search for nests and monitor nests of all these birds and capture birds using this nets. Uh, this is what we call the demographic side of the project. Um, this is another figure showing another side of the project, which is the survey part, where there are thousands of points that have been randomly placed, um, indicated by the little dots on the map here on the coast throughout the Northeast um, that uh, survey technicians have gone out and done point count surveys, counting all of the birds they hear by sight or sound um, all around them, and these are all placed in marshes. So some of the major findings that have come out of um, this work to date. So this is a finding from the same paper um, showing on the Orient U there's a year on the x-axis going from um, farther uh, longer ago to more present day. And then on the y-axis is specialist relative abundance. So specialist being specialist marsh birds um, uh, for this system. Well, I'll go over a couple of them in a minute. But as you can see, comparing um, 1998 on the far left going up to 2012, that line is going down, indicating that we're seeing declines in our specialist marsh bird um, abundance in our communities of specialist marsh birds. Uh, so what is this for specific species? Uh, so first for the salt marsh sparrow, uh, which there's a, um, often a lot of news about. Oops. Oops. Uh, they've been declining at a rate of 9% per year, um, comparing using the survey data. I just talked about all of those little dots along the coast comparing um, 90s data to present day data or closer to present day data, we see a 9% decline over that time period. Here we have seaside sparrows. And interestingly, there's been no change, no trend in their population changes, uh, changing from the 90s to present day. Then we have Nelson sparrows, and they've been declining at a rate of 4.2% from the 90s to today. Willets, also no trend. Populations haven't been increasing or declining um, when you compare present day to the 90s. And then finally, clapper rails are declining at a rate of 4.6% uh, 4 per year. Okay, so looking, zooming in on the salt marsh sparrow, which um, is one of our kind of famous species we talked about, we talk about with tidal marshes, because if you look at this plot, this was some modeling done by um, another student in our lab group um, showing on the y-axis, the female population size of salt marsh sparrows um, and year in the, on the x-axis. And this is forecasting into the future how the population will change over time. Um, so all these uh, multiple different lines with uh, different um, darkness levels and the, and the little hashtags or the breaks um, are different uh, scenarios, sea level rise scenarios, um, where you can see basically over time, over the next couple of decades, that female population size is going down to zero, which would indicate uh, an expected extinction. Okay, and then you can look here as well. Um, this is another plot um, kind of showing the mechanism we think is the case for this. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but salt marsh sparrows require about a 23 day window to lay their eggs, incubate their eggs, hatch their chicks, and then fledge their chicks. And they need to have a 23 day window where tides aren't high enough to cause failure, right? So either by the eggs floating out of the nest or by the chicks drowning from a high tide event. This plot is showing um, on the y-axis the proportion or, or the probability, or no, proportion of time with a 23 day window. So the window needed to successfully reproduce with year on the x-axis. And we can see around 2055, um, the across 
this well, this data came from Long Island Sound area. Um, that there aren't, uh, there isn't, there aren't going to be 23 day windows without catastrophic high tides for salt marsh sparrows to effectively reproduce. Okay, and so what I've um, hinted at a little bit thus far is that sea level rise is going to be causing a problem um, for these species, especially the salt marsh sparrow. So this plot is just um, coming from a paper. Um, we're familiar with a lot of different estimates of how sea level rise um, is causing or is increasing over time. And what I find interesting with these species, tidal marsh birds, is that they're already adapted to their nest flooding with saltwater tide is something that has already impacted tidal marshes for uh, millennia. However, the rate of sea level rise is causing nests to get wet faster and more frequently, which is problematic. Because for these species, it causes nest flooding. So uh, the reason for the salt marsh sparrow extinction, we believe from all of these different research efforts so far, excuse me, is the nest being unable to fledge chicks. So either eggs flooding out of nests or chicks drowning from high tides coming in earlier than they would be. That 23 day window, uh, they're not having that 23 day window without these catastrophic high tides to be able to get their chicks out of the nest um, and successfully fledged. So the way that I started on my dissertation research was looking at these trends, how we see some of these species are rapidly declining and yet some of them, like the seaside sparrow and willet, we didn't detect trends in terms of either their populations growing or declining, which is something we would worry about. And my question, questions all arise me uh, mechanicalistically from why would that be? What, what sorts of different strategies do these species have to combat nest flooding such that the salt marsh sparrow is declining, but the seaside sparrow isn't, at least within the Northeast? So my approach to my dissertation has been the following. My first research chapter um, is on factors affecting nest survival. Um, so I'll be looking at um, what factors in the marsh affect uh, four different species, the salt marsh sparrow, seaside sparrow, willow, and clapperill from fledging chicks because we haven't really looked at all of them together uh, and how you know, marsh size, the amount of development nearby, um, elevation, things like this impact each of them differentially in terms of how many chicks they can successfully fledge from the nest. The next chapter will be looking at nest site selection. So even though nests, or excuse me, tidal marshes look homogenous on the outside, they're contained of grasses, structurally they don't look super complex. Uh, however, each of these species nests in slightly different places. So I'm interested in how they select those nest sites, what factors they're keying into on the marsh to select their nest sites. Um, my next chapter is looking at behavioral responses to nest flooding, which I talked a little bit about last time and I'll talk about more today. Um, so what do the birds actually do when the nest floods at both the adult and the chick level? And then finally, uh, I have a chapter devoted to physiological mechanisms for chick climbing behaviors. So one of the things that um, we'll talk about that has come out of my behavioral research and that we knew a little bit before I started this project is that chicks will climb up vegetation to avoid drowning um, when they're certain ages. And I'm interested in how they do this and what factors impact that behavior. And in this presentation, I'll mostly be focusing on these last two um, uh, bullet points in terms of talking about uh, results so far. Okay, so before I get into my research, I did wanna cover one other collaborator's research that speaks to the idea of behavior um, related to nest flooding. So this plot here is showing the change in the height a bird, uh, this is for salt marsh sparrows, placed their nest. So um, zero is outlined in red. So if the dot falls below that line, that means that the, that the bird um, put their nest lower in the ground. And if the uh, black dot is above the line, it indicates that the bird placed their nest 
higher up off the ground in the vegetation. And that they found in this paper uh, is related to whether their previous nest was depredated, fledged, or flooded. So what this plot shows in a nutshell is if a bird's, a salt marsh sparrow's first nest um, failed due to depredation. So here's a cute little raccoon having an egg snack. Um, then they, the next nest that uh, adult made, they place lower down in the vegetation, likely to conceal the nest better from predators. However, if the female's first nest of the season failed from flooding, they would place their next nest higher up in the vegetation. So this is interesting because we're interested with sea level rise, how these species, what kind of flexibility they have in their nesting to be able to persist. So it's kind of useful knowledge to know that they have um, some adjustment in what happened to their previous nest, how they deal with their next nest. Uh, but it also illustrates a trade-off between depredation and flooding. So if all the birds, if all the salt marsh sparrows in a given marsh just put their nests up higher, that might not be an effective solution anyway to sea level rise because then they'd be at increased risk of having their nest depredated. But that's setting the stage for behavioral responses. Okay, so the first question I'm going to talk about from my research is how do birds respond to nest flooding events as they happen? So what we just looked at is how birds respond to nest flooding after they happen, what they do in terms of placing their next nest. I wanted to know how birds respond to nest flooding events during the actual flooding event. And then how much flexibility do these strategies offer as sea levels continue to rise? So as I've mentioned, um, I went about studying all of my chapters with these four species, the salt marsh sparrow, seaside sparrow, willet, and clapper rail. And for this first chapter, I used infrared radiation augmented cameras to film nests at night during high tide events. Um, so here's just a photo of me putting out a video camera. I bought them from this ghost hunting online website, which actually completely suited my needs because the highest high tides happen at night. And, I, and so I needed to record uh, during near total darkness what these birds are doing. And then for some of the videos, uh, just to orient you to some of the videos you're going to see, Really hoping this works this time because the last time I was with you all, we had some trouble showing the videos. But what you'll see are a kind of purple um, looking uh, video because there's, because of the way I recorded the videos. Um, I'll point out before we start each video where the nest is and then where the bird is. So in this little example here, we have the nest um, and then we have a salt marsh sparrow adult over here. Okay, so this chapter had to do with a couple of things. The first being, how do adults respond to nest flooding? So, some preliminary results. The first takeaway here, so there's proportion of time the adults are completely absent from a nest during uh, a nest flooding event on the y-axis, so going from zero to one, and the species on the x-axis, uh, salt marsh sparrow, seaside sparrow, willet, and clapper rail. So uh, you can see that uh, salt marsh sparrows and willets are largely absent from their, uh, the nest during flooding events because their rates are pretty close to one. Nearly 100% of the time they're absent from their nest during flooding. Uh, however, there is some variation. You can see for the salt marsh sparrows bar, um, it's not just at one. There's some variation there. It's thick. Um, and there's an outlier all the way at zero where an adult was present the full time a nest was flooded. Um, but that was just when there is a small amount of water in the nest. Interestingly, if you look at seaside sparrows and clapper rails, um, they're absent from the nest a lot of the time, but you can also have someone be um, absent, you know, 60 per closer to 60% of the time, meaning that they were present for about 40% of the time. Um, so just across species, we can see that species uh, are a little bit different in terms of how often they're at the nest during flooding events. 
And then this plot sort of is the inverse of the plot we just looked at, a little bit easier to read perhaps. This is uh, looking at the proportion of time adults are at the nest in any capacity. So whether, I don't talk about it too much in this presentation, but there were four main behaviors we were looking at, excuse me, uh, for the adults to do during flooding. One is that they're incubating the eggs or brooding the chicks. So were the adults sitting on the eggs or chicks during flooding? Um, additionally, were they using their bill to move around eggs, so to put eggs back in the nest or stop them from floating out? Or were they using their bill to move around vegetation to kind of restructure the nest uh, during the flooding event or to increase the height during the flooding event? Both of these behaviors have been documented in clapper rails, one of the four species. And then finally, were they present in any capacity not representing those other three behaviors? Were they at the nest doing something, but it doesn't fall into those categories. So this plot here on the right shows that. And again, unsurprising, we're seeing the same trend since it's the inverse of the other plot. Salt marsh sparrows and willets are largely absent uh, from the nest during flooding events, but seaside sparrows and clapper rails um, are present more often doing some of those behaviors I just listed. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple of example videos uh, of some of the behaviors that we saw. So you're going to see this video here is of a salt marsh sparrow. The nest is outlined in white currently. And the adult is going to approach from the bottom right hand side of the camera or of the image here. So I'm going to press play. And you're going to see that that nest has some water in it with four eggs. A salt marsh sparrow adult comes up to the nest. She goes in, thinks about incubating, probably picks up on the water and decides to leave. I think that's kind of emblematic of the results I've been seeing with the adults for salt marsh sparrows is that they're just often not present during the flooding events. Uh, similarly for willets, which we talked about just now. This is a willet nest. You've got three eggs right here outlined in the black circle. And what you're going to see now is no adult, but just water um, coming into the nest and causing those eggs to float up. and no adult around. So this also was a video not in real time, but a sped up video uh, encompassing probably 45 minutes or an hour where the uh, eggs were floating up with the tide and no adult was present. Okay, but as I mentioned, we see that those, uh, the seaside sparrows and clapper rails were present more often at nests uh, than the other species. And some of the things they did predominantly clapper rails were interesting. So we expected to find this, but in this video, you'll see um, this clapper rail is, um, yeah, so this is the nest. There's a clapper rail to the right here. Um, and it's going to be moving around vegetation with its bill. Yep, there's the clapper rail. Okay, so there's water in the nest. There are eggs underneath this clapper rail. You can see it taking bits of vegetation, moving it around, kind of tugging on the nest. Play it one more time because it's a little hard to see. So again, the adults on some eggs, there's a lot of water in that nest. Um, so this adult is sitting on the eggs, but also moving around vegetation in an effort we think to either increase the height of the nest or to just keep it structured well when you have water coming in and moving things around. <laughs> 
Okay, so that was just some of the beginning results I have for what the adults do. Again, before this, we really didn't know too much about that. Um, but my next question is, how do nestlings respond to nest flooding? What do the chicks do? And this is predominantly looked at for the seaside sparrow and salt marsh sparrow because I wasn't able to get too much data from willets and clapper rails because their chicks are precocial, so they hatch and leave the nest rather quickly. Um, Another one, what the chicks do when the water comes. <laughs> so um, we're going to go in reverse order this time and show um, some examples of what they do, and then I have a plot to show everyone. So here outlined in the white circle is a nest. So the nest cup is actually obscured from view right now. It's um, at the bottom of that circle, but what you are actively seeing is the uh, woven nest dome above the nest. There is vegetation the bird wove into um, a little canopy above the nest. And this is a salt marsh sparrow nest. Um, as I mentioned, that's outlining kind of the top of the nest canopy. And what you're going to see is chicks um, climb from the center of this white circle up to that um, top white circle. They're basically going to climb vertically and up onto that um, woven nest canopy um, because a high tide is coming up. Now this video is really fast. I'm going to play it a couple times. So you're, you can see now that one chick popped up on the top of the nest, uh, the woven nest canopy, and then here a second chick is popping up on top. And again, this is a sped up video, so this happened over a couple minutes, um, but I sped it up so we can see it more readily. So I'm gonna play that again, now that you kind of know what you're looking for. Um, okay. So again, you can see movement inside where the nest cup is, you see this first chick pop up on the top. And then a second chick is climbing up vertically on the top of that woven nest canopy. And I'm going to play this actually one more time and draw your attention to towards the right of the uh, those two little chicks on top of the nest. There's actually a third chick that tried to get out of the nest through the side. So if you can see my cursor, I'm not sure if you can, there's a third chick trying to get out this way. So I wasn't expecting before starting this that chicks might have different avenues by which they get out of the nest. So I don't have the data for it or the results yet, but one, um, way I'm studying this is what factors impact whether a, a chick chooses to move vertically up the nest or out via the side vegetation. So this is an example of um, chicks moving out uh, through their for front door, if you will, of their nest. Um, there's two chicks here um, circled in the white circle and we're going to see them when in real time, they've already come out of the nest and are trying to move further out of the nest. Look at this. So these little birds are not opposed to climbing on their siblings <laughs> to get up and for survival. <laughs> I'll play that just one more time. Okay, so I'm still working on this data as well, but this is just a plot um, kind of relating chick age to how many chicks climb. So on the y-axis is the proportion of chicks that climb, this is for salt marsh sparrows, going from zero to one. So um, zero would be none of the, the chicks in a nest climbed and one would be 100% of the chicks climbed. Um, and so you can see, and then uh, the chick age, how old the chick was in days is on the x-axis going from zero to 10. 
Um, and this is showing something we, we already thought was the case, um, but we wanted to know more about. So you can see that um, nests where chicks are between um, just hatched, day zero, up until um, almost six days old, about, um, about uh, five and a half days old, nobody's climbing up and out of that nest, uh, meaning that if the water came up too high, they would likely drown. Um, then you start to see some differences where half the chicks are climbing up and out of the nest when they're between about four and a half days old up until uh, nine days old. And then we have two data points up here where all the chicks in the next uh, climbed up and out of it um, when they were uh, quite old, eight, uh, nine, ten days old. And note that these, uh, for this species, chicks can fledge and fully leave the nest um, at an earliest date of eight, eight days old. Okay, so last aspect of this chapter that I'll talk about. Um, so it's uh, one thing to know, we wanted to know kind of what the birds do at the adult and chick levels um, when they're, uh, when the nests are flooding. And so far we found um, that individuals do these different behaviors. The adults do all of the things I listed. They sit on eggs or chicks during nest flooding, um, move around man or manage eggs and vegetation, um, or they're doing something else at the nest. I didn't talk too much about it, but that depends on what species you are. Um, we did talk about how salt marsh sparrows and willets are often absent, but clapperails and seaside sparrows are present more. Um, and then that chicks largely either drown or they can climb up the nest either vertically or through side vegetation to wait out a high tide before going back in the nest. But then the question is, how do nests fare when adults are active at the nest during flooding? So if adults are active, let's say at the nest during flooding, let's say seaside sparrows or clapper rails, is there an advantage to doing that? And here's some preliminary information about what we found for that. So there's four different plots here representing the four different species, salt marsh sparrows in the top left, then seaside sparrows top right, then willets uh, bottom left, and clapper rails bottom right. On the y-axis is the proportion of time the adults are at the nest during flooding, and the x-axis is the number of offspring loss. So a minus three would indicate that Pardon me, either three eggs or chicks were lost on that night. Zero would indicate that no chicks or eggs were lost on that night due to the high tide. And there is one two in here, that two in the bottom right hand corner, the clapper rail plot was for two eggs that floated to the edge of the nest and the clapper rail rolled them back into the nest. Um, yeah. And they had been on the edge of the nest when we first put the video out that night. So they rolled them back in after. Um, and what you can see here is sort of interesting and not necessarily what I expected. Um, let's start with the bottom right hand plot for clapper rails. Uh, you can see that when there's uh, one egg or chick lost on a given high tide night, the adult is present a lot more at the nest doing different behaviors, managing the eggs or the vegetation, or sitting on the eggs or um, not, because we see um, that blue box extends all the way up to almost being 100% um, present at the nest 100% of the time it's wet, um, down to about 20%, with a lot of variation. And then you can see at when zero chicks are lost, or that time the adult put two eggs back in the nest, they're really absent. They're not there a lot at the nest. Um, we can see that trend. There's pretty small sample sizes for this, but also with seaside sparrows, the top right, when you have three or two chicks, two or three chicks lost or eggs, the adult is present a lot more during that time than when zero chicks are lost or eggs or one. We don't see this trend as much for the salt marsh sparrow and willet, the two left-hand plots. Um, that's not super surprising because we already saw that they're just not very active at the nest. The adults aren't very active when the nest is flooding. Um, but in terms of the seaside sparrows and willets, one thing we might say about this is, and will come out in further analysis I do, is whether the high tides 
where they lost one or two or three chicks or eggs are when they're really high tides and the adults being there could have prevented further losses. You know, a clapper rail losing one egg or chick isn't that much of a cost when you have 12 eggs or chicks and maybe being present is preventing some more losses. However, for the seaside sparrow, we're seeing kind of greater losses. So there's a lot more to investigate on this, um, but it's pretty interesting. Okay, and then one more plot for this chapter. So this time, the change in the number of eggs or chicks that night, the same as the number of offspring lost is on the y-axis. So um, mostly zero indicating no chicks or eggs were lost down to four chicks or eggs were lost due to a high tide and then tide height on the x-axis. So I think there's two interesting things here. One, it's not surprising that as the tide gets higher, um, adults are losing more eggs or chicks to it. But you can also see there's a really great range of tide heights going from about 1.5 meters all the way up to half a meter where zero chicks or uh, eggs are lost across all of these species. So there definitely are systems in place for them to not lose um, all their chicks or eggs on a given high tide night. Okay, so moving into the last chapter I'll talk about um, this picture is a little gruesome. I now realize that I'm looking at it. Um, but so we often, uh, most, most studies with birds, I feel like think about predation a lot as shaping development um, of songbirds or sparrows. Um, but in this system, of course, um, tidal marshes flooding is a really big factor that shapes development. So how fast um, uh, offspring grow, where they allocate resources to growing, et cetera. And in these two pictures, they're just showing this climbing behavior that I'm really interested in with the salt marsh and seaside sparrows. Um, so my main question here is how does flooding frequency impact chick climbing behavior and allocation of resources to bone and muscle that would enable that climbing? So basically for, for individuals that, um, uh, for individuals that develop so rapidly over 10 days, um, and they're able to do this climbing stuff before they can fly, are they differentially, differentially allocating resources to build, let's say, their muscle and their bones um, in their legs to be able to climb up before flying? Maybe that's more important for these species. And so I'm comparing that across species who flood, whose nests flood more frequently or less frequently. So this is just showing my um, hypotheses. So um, if you uh, nest, if your nest floods more frequently, um, then I imagine your developmental speed would be faster in terms of chicks climbing at an earlier age and their muscles um, growing and their bones ossifying or hardening in their legs at an earlier age as well. So the first way I'm studying this is doing this climbing experiment. So um, this also has conservation implications because as we've talked about for let's say the salt marsh sparrow, um, nest flooding and chicks drowning is, is a huge consequence to the species driving them to extinction. I'm interested in how early chicks of salt marsh sparrows and the other sparrow species can climb because that solves the problem of drowning if you can avoid the flood altogether. And is there variation in how early they climb such that natural selection could act on that trait and we could wind up with a population with younger chicks being able to climb than we currently have, which could help the species. So the way I'm studying this is by taking little chicks out of their nests for a nice little experiment and then putting them back um, right afterwards. So nobody's harmed in any long-term way from this experiment. I take a chick out, I age them, and I put them into this uh, experimental setup. I have a plastic container with um, native vegetation uh, in it and an old nest that I took out after the nest was finished. Um, and that's clipped in there. And then I slowly flood the box with water and I videotape what happens and I have a measuring tape in there to record how high the chicks um, climb. And note that if a chick isn't climbing, I stop the water from coming in, take them out, dry them off and put them back. So nobody's drowning in this experiment, just in real life. 
Okay, so some quick results about this. So this plot shows on the y-axis the amount the, that the little chick climbed. Um, the age in days is on the x-axis. And then the dots represent um, different species. So in this experiment so far, I've used salt marsh sparrows whose nests flood the most theoretically, seaside sparrows, and they're in blue, seaside sparrows in red whose nests um, flood a lot but slightly less, and then song sparrows, a closely related species in purple um, that do not nest in marshes, or at least not directly in marshes, but are closely related and can be used as a comparison. Um, so a couple of things from this. I'm not done collecting data for this project, but one thing we can see if we're looking at salt marsh sparrows is that they um, can climb a little bit as early as four days old, but they're really not climbing um, uh, high amounts to avoid what I would imagine is flooding until days six or seven, um, until they're, they're that, that age. Uh, again, I don't have enough data for seaside sparrows or song sparrows yet, but one interesting thing um, that is not in support of my hypothesis is that song sparrows at around four and a half days, they're climbing a bunch more, a little bit higher than, um, than seaside or salt marsh sparrows are. Um, so more updates for that later. Sorry about that, my dog's having a hissy fit. Okay. <laughs> Just a moment. All right, she's gone. Um, so the last part of this is, so if these chicks can climb at different ages, right, that means that as they're developing, they're allocating resources to different parts of their bodies at different rates. I'm interested in how they're differentially allocating those resources to kind of explain how they're able to do this climbing at different ages, which is what seems to be coming out in that other study. So um, this picture is a little sad on the left, but um, when chicks drown um, of flooding in the field, we collect them for um, further analyses like this project. Um, and they can be used to um, do what's pictured in the bottom uh, right is a mouse. Uh, Scientists are able to use different chemicals to stain uh, bones as they're in the process of hardening. So I'm going to stain um, these little chick individuals to see where their bones are hardening earliest so I can compare it across the species. And I'll also be dissecting understand where they're allocating muscle. And again, relate that to how often um, their nests are flooding and then the age at which they climb to kind of link up what they're doing behaviorally with the physiological mechanism. Okay, so I think that puts me at about time. Um, I'd like to just thank quickly um, a number of uh, uh, funding resources and a lot of um, volunteers um, and uh, research technicians who have helped with this project. Corey, as you know, helped on my project one summer, which was super great. Um, I couldn't have done all of this without all of this help. And then with that, I'd be happy to take questions. And um, yeah, thanks so much for listening. Thanks, Sam. Uh, I had a question. Um, earlier, you had a plot of change in number of eggs in the nest during the high tide event. Yes. And there was one point that was plus two. Yes. Did a bird lay eggs during a high tide oh. event? No, that was, um, that's a good guess though. No, that was the clapper rail that dr pushed the eggs back in. Okay. So when we first put the camera out, the eggs were like just outside the nest cup rim um, before the tide came in. And then during the tide, the adult pushed them back in. Um, so it's kind of a weird example, but I think that means that two were added. That, yeah, that makes sense. Outside, they'd be dead. So yeah, that's why that was <laughs> Um, other questions for Sam? You can type them in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself and ask. I think I have a question. Oh yeah, go for it. Um, I'm calling in from Maine and here we have, we've, I know that at Rachel Carson, they've been doing some projects to 
build nesting platforms or kind yeah. of up. I wondered what you thought about that and if there's success there. Yeah, that's a great question, especially because, um, so I, I know the people who work there and are working on that. Um, the idea actually came from, so I was talking with uh, Bree, one of the authors on the paper earlier, who's working on that because uh, in Florida, I worked in Florida for a number of years and they have um, uh, the grasshopper or um, grasshopper sparrow subspecies that's pretty quickly going extinct. Um, and they're manually, their prairies flood sometimes, and they're manually adding soil underneath to increase the height of nests, which is what they're trying out at Rachel Carson. Um, I guess the short answer is that I think it's great to, to try out any sort of conservation measures that could work to keep that species around. The problem is that when you have a whole species that's going extinct on such a large scale, something like individually increasing the heights of nests will cost so much money and just not be feasible to save an entire species. Um, so there's other conservation um, efforts we're working on or people, especially at the federal government are working on. For example, um, uh, a lot of um, Fish and Wildlife Service is trying out adding uh, deposition of soil to the top of entire marshes. And so that stops the marsh from being productive for bird nesting for a couple of years, but then the vegetation can grow up through that soil. And then you've suddenly elevated the height of the um, marsh platform so that water from the tide won't get into nests as much because the whole thing is already a couple inches higher. So that's one method um, some groups are trying to employ. Um, another one is called facilitated marsh migration, which is uh, marshes naturally over millennia have, you know, increased in their extent or been drawn back through the sea level rising and falling naturally. The problem is that sea level rise is happening way faster now than it has in historical changes in sea level rise. So to, for marshes to be able to expand into further upland environments, there'd have to be um, intervention by people cutting down trees and otherwise fostering that expansion. Wow. Um, yeah, so that's something that's being tried out. That is very expensive. And the other issue, though, is that there's a lot of development. We like to live on coasts, right? So there's a lot of houses in that area, um, that boundary. But that's another uh, method. Um, and then living shorelines is another thing they're exploring. But the short answer is, yeah, I think any kind of method like that is great. It's just that's not going to solve the whole, the, save the whole species, unfortunately. So I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand that, that chicks die because they drown. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of kinds of birds, they would also die because of uh, hypothermia or the whatever the birdie equivalent of hypothermia is. Right. Um, and I know this is not your specific topic, but I wondered if you had any sense of whether repeated soakings, even yeah. if they didn't drown, had, a, you know, are, the, are they just able to cope with that or is that also a cause of death? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something I definitely wonder about. Um, excuse me. I So again, I haven't studied that directly, but I can... Um, fairly comfortably say that I think this these species or specifically salt marsh sparrows have a higher higher tolerance um, those uh, chicks for um, repeated soaking by this cold water because we don't often find chicks that are dead uh, well actually that's a good question you know that's something I might look at more in depth um, my gut feeling is that it's not just them getting wet because we definitely have nests where if they don't drown, they're still alive. Um, but it would be good to confirm that that's the case. Um, it seems as far with my, with my research that they get wet and as long as they don't actually drown, that they're fine. Um, and another thing to speak to that is the egg stage. So we have research that's been, that was done a number of years ago using eye buttons, which are um, these little temperature data loggers you can put in nests. And they put them in a lot of salt marsh sparrow nests and found that 
at the egg stage, nests will go underwater up to nine times for up to an hour and a half and still those chicks still hatch out of those eggs. And that's problematic for two reasons. The eggs are getting cold, um, so you can't develop when you're cold. Um, and then also that stops gas exchange because there's little holes in eggs that allow the developing embryo to exchange gases with the atmosphere. So I do have an undergraduate student who's um, working on a project with me on those eggs. And I can give some short results on that, which is that we are interested in if those holes in the eggs, they're called pores, mm -hmm. um, if there's a different density of those pores in uh, species whose nests uh, flood more so than those that don't. So the hypothesis being that salt marsh sparrows whose nests flood a lot, that they'll have smaller pores that are spread out more, or so, sorry, smaller pores, but more of them. Um, so a greater pore density because uh, water can get into the eggs through those pores. So there was a study done by another group that looked at, um, they put dye in water and they pretty much dunked chicken eggs in water for a long period of time and grebe eggs in that same water. When they opened up the eggs, the chicken eggs were blue on the inside because that water seeped in. The grebe eggs were not blue on the inside because they nest in a watery environment. Their nests are, you know, floating a lot in water and they get wet a lot. So they, and they found that they had different pore density and size. Mm -hmm. So the short answer for this study with the undergraduate student, he used salt marsh sparrow and seaside sparrow eggs that had already failed, that we had collected. He stained them and looked at them under a microscope and counted them. And we have evidence that um, salt marsh sparrows do have greater pore density than seaside sparrows, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that's a long story to say that I'm pretty sure they can handle more, the chicks can handle getting cold more than other species, but I should look at that directly. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sam? Yeah. How, 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 I'm trying to figure out how to put this so it makes sense. I'm wondering what the extent of their coastal um, nesting is. Does it go from Maine clear down the uh, eastern coast? Just to Florida? That's a great question. So for salt marsh sparrows, their breeding range is uh, Maine, or is it, it's uh, I think south, southern Maine or northern New Hampshire, uh, down to about uh, Delaware. Um, and then their wintering range is uh, from around Delaware down to Florida. And they're a fully United States species. Um, and then seaside sparrows, the northernmost part of their breeding range is in Connecticut, and their breeding range goes further south all the way to Florida, I believe, and then um, along some of the southern states coast. Uh, and then clapper rails, their northernmost breeding range is also in Connecticut, um, and then I think they go all the way down to Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and over to Texas. Yes, and then, well, the other thing is there's different subspecies for, uh, like, clapper rails. They're, yeah, all the way down the coast, um, across the bottom states coast, and then California, other clapper rail sub subspecies, um, and then seaside sparrows, too. There's a number of subspecies like that. Do the ones that have the more extensive range for breeding have the best chance of survival? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I mean, but, but I mean, it might not be true, might not be helpful because water level is raising, is, is rising everywhere. Right. Um, so I think that's more likely that, that the range isn't really what would can convey, you know, a better ability to survive because sea level rise is happening everywhere. However, there are different rates of sea level rise, even New England compared to mid-Atlantic states. There is variation in that. Um, but I think it would more have to do with their phylogenetic history. So what type of bird are they? You know, sparrows are a kind of weird bird to be in a marsh, whereas rails are water birds that have a history of dealing with water. Same with something like a willet, a shorebird. Um, uh, yeah. 
Can I ask another question, Sam? Yeah. Have you looked at ditching and whether or not different levels of ditching have any effect on mortality or anything? I'm thinking like maybe the hydrology is different or something. Yeah, that's a great question as well. Um, so I haven't looked at ditching myself, but, and I'm not, I'm actually not sure how much we've looked at ditching because um, one thing is that there are ditches in 98% of North or New England marshes. Um, so it's pretty universal that there's ditching, um, man-made ditching, at least in where we study. Um, it's different uh, in Southern states a little bit. Um, however, ditches do cause problems, which are that when they're not maintained, they can get bigger and they can kind of keep water up on the marsh. I'm not sure as much of the mechanics of that, but they can cause actually water staying up on the marsh more, which is bad. Um, so I think there are different efforts to deal with that a little bit. Um, yeah. We One of the projects in Maine is filling them in with, right. with Spartina and the idea is that it will actually help accretion in the marsh. So it might yeah. So do you work for, um, do you work at Rachel Carson? I, no, I, I just finished a master's project oh, right. in um, salt marsh rapid assessments. I worked oh, with cool. the state of Maine. So I know some of them, but yeah, I'm just, and I'm from, from the coast. So I know a lot of those marshes and. Oh, awesome. Yeah. yeah that's helpful. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to talk sometime. I've, I'm really obsessed with ditching, so if you ever want to talk about ditches. Oh, I'd love to because ditching isn't something I think about the most, um, but I know there are restoration efforts related to ditching, so yeah, I'd love to do that. Great. Any other questions, especially if there were any in the chat that I missed? I don't think I can see the chat while I'm sharing my screen. I don't see any other questions in the chat. Does anyone else have a question for Sam? Uh, Sam, I have another question on the, the ditching because last winter in February, I was on a, a trip that was <clears throat> birding trip. We were looking along the, this was almost spring, looking along the coast of Texas and, and Louisiana. <clears throat> And some of these marshes go miles back in, and there were uh, all kinds of birds in the ditching. And I wish I had known more questions to ask at the time, because mm -hmm. there were lots of rails and many, many other birds nesting in the grasses right along the, the ditches. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the, that's the thing is that um, so I'm pretty focused on the Northeast, but there's really different sized marshes and other elements of the topography of marshes. You know, for example, just in kind of the Atlantic coast, marshes in New Jersey are huge. Um, and there's actually greater predation pressure on salt marsh sparrows there than flooding. Um, whereas in the rest of the range, breeding range, flooding is the big thing. And flooding is still a big thing there, but there happens to be more predation, maybe because the marshes are so big they can nest further back. I'm not sure the mechanism. Um, and then same with these other, you know, subspecies. There, there are rails all along the U.S. coast, you know. Um, and I don't know as much about how marshes are different, like where you're talking about or in California. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's more complex depending on where you're talking about. So I don't know if that answered anything. But <laughs> so I have a question for Grace. I'm just curious how you knew to join this. Oh, I, I live in Vermont now and I got, I somehow online got the Audubon message. And I, oh, okay. And I think I knew, I recognized your name, Sam, from, there was an article in the New York Times that was yeah. so good about yeah. summer sparrows. It was, I, I loved that. Yeah. I wondered, yeah, wondered if you got feedback from that, because it seemed like you got some notice. Yeah, um, we could put that in the chat, too, if people want to look it up. Um, Corey's featured in some of the pictures there, too. Um, so, yeah, that came out uh, in 20, 
18, I guess, or uh, I don't know time anymore. Um, but yeah, there, the salt marsh sparrow specifically is definitely has a lot of attention from the public, from the federal government for sure, from state agencies. Um, and uh, yeah, I think of it as, you know, this is a little sad, but I'm not quite sure that we can save the salt marsh sparrow or at least save it in really large numbers the way it's historically been. But we have all these other species which are going to be at risk too. So by doing these restoration efforts and um, studying all of these species, we can you know, work to keep them around, which is kind of my goal. I just posted two things in the chat box. The first one was a reminder about our next Audubon program, which will be November 17th. Um, Eric Slayton will be joining us to talk about his bird banding operation up on Hogback Mountain. And then below that, I posted the link to the New York Times story that Sam just mentioned. Great, thank you, Corey. Great, thank you. Are there other questions for Sam? No, just the thank you. Yes, yes. thank you, thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for updating us. Thanks so much. Of course. Um, absolutely. Thanks so much for having me back. I hope I had some new things here um, for you. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Keep up the good work. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, Sam. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this evening. Okay. Thanks, thanks. for too. Good, good, good night, everyone. Good night. Have a great evening. <laughs>